about the 40 Days in the Word so far? I love it. It has been awesome. I've spent lots of hours each day in the Word, and it has been a joy. How's the 40 Days in the Word been for you so far? It's been absolutely awesome. I'm enjoying it thoroughly. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's awesome. I think uh, it's a great thing for the church, and I'm learning a lot. What is your favorite thing about the 40 Days in the Word so far? Well, I think that it just made me a commitment. I have to make a commitment to myself to just be in the Word more often. And I think it's refreshing a lot of things that I that I kind of let it slide. What do you think about 40 Days in the Word so far? Absolutely loving it. I am just really feeling like I'm getting closer to God. It's teaching me new ways to read the Bible. I love it. I love it. It's helping me dissect the Word, and that's what I like about it. Um, I think it's a great series just because with my life being so crazy busy, it helps me to slow down and just take time to spend in the Word of God. I think it's great. How do you feel about 40 Days in the Word so far? I, I think it's really good. It's because it's good to build a habit, and a lot of people have trouble with that, so it's uh, really helpful. Um, I love it. I love that I can... Uh, I get to read it and I get to break it down and I get to write it down what I actually think and what I think it means. Well, what I like about it is it gives you a chance to develop a daily devotional life and I think that's essential for mission. Where are your quiet times usually? Well, uh, my wife and I have been getting up extra early in the morning and we go out onto the couches in our living room and we both get a blanket, turn the lights on, read our Bible, we have a quiet time and uh, that seems to be working out very well. Um, I get up early. I get up about 5.30, 5.45, and then I spend a good 45 minutes with God before the rest of the house wakes up. So that's my special quiet time with Him. We just moved, and I have a chair in a nice, comfortable corner with a little light, and I enjoy that time very much. Uh, usually real early in the morning, around 5.30, 6 o'clock, before I unwind. In the car. It's quiet. And nothing else is bothering me. Uh, you, you my wife and I do it right before we go to bed in our room. Before we go. So that's a good time for us to find the kids. Um, we all, my family does our devotions together at the table, but then I like to, I like to break away in my room and I like to read by myself and, and uh, really concentrate on what it's saying. <laughs> um, have you joined a small group yet? Yes, I have. Jim and Lisa Burris, love you guys. What's your favorite part about that? Um, just connecting with other peers my age. It's just gives you real foundation to build on. I am in Dr. Stacy Johnson. It's awesome. Y'all should join a small group. <laughs> yes, I'm participating in small groups. So it's, it's good to have other people participating. And the same thing you're participating in and encourages you. It's going very well. Um, we have people that have been uh, in the Word for a long, long time that this is just really a new thing for them. Um, learning how to um, picture it, learning how to just, you know, uh, dissect it. Yes, I love my small group. Well, we're small group leaders, and we have a lot of new members in our group this time. And it's just been awesome to get to know these new people and just to see their love that they have for God and the Word at this time, too. Have you been um, participating in the small groups? I have. I am in actually Pastor Tim and Angie's Young Adult Small Group, and I love it. Um, any particular highlights or anything special that God has really just um, been speaking to you about during the 40 Days in the Word? I love it, the, the picture it concept, because that just really helps the Bible to come alive. And uh, it's a very creative way to look at stories and things in the Bible that people wouldn't normally think about that way. Well, the, 30, the 40 days has had opportunity for me to give my husband a special gift. He has never really been one to memorize scripture, but for his birthday, I did not have a birthday present for him, but we sat for three hours and I taught him how to memorize scripture. And so he now has um, about five of the scriptures memorized. So that was how we spent his birthday, memorizing scripture. Well, I'm going to be going to 20 memory verses, I think, uh, and uh, got them pretty much all memorized. I just need to remember the order. But I think the one that really spoke to me the most is the one where, where, where is it, all authority has been given to me in heaven. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And they tell go into all the world and preach and teach. Uh, make disciples of them by the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because it, it actually just re, what how to say? It just uh, opened up my vision that that's what we're supposed to be doing. We get saved to do something.
the, I like the revelations that Scott has given me on things that I've been reading practically my entire life. Uh, I know that sounds very cliche, but it's really happening in my spirit. It's making me feel absolutely incredible. I think the concept itself of just really learning how to um, take uh, phrase by phrase and put ourselves into it. Um, yes, there was a verse um, in the first week about God giving us desires and in his time fulfilling those desires and giving us zeal and that meant a lot to me. So yes, it spoke to me very much. Um, I think my favorite way that I've learned is to picture it, um, put yourself in their shoes and try to break it down to see how they see things. Yeah. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. How many are glad we're doing 40 days in the Word together? Anybody? Today is day 14 of 40 days in the Word. So uh, we are far from even halfway over. We are really just getting started. So if you haven't joined in yet, if you haven't jumped in yet, it's not too late. Because remember, the goal of this campaign is to develop the habit of daily Bible study. And it takes more than a couple weeks to develop a good habit. Somebody say amen. So whether you've done the Bible studies every single day or if you've done just a handful or maybe you haven't done any at all, we're just going to keep on encouraging you and keep on uh, praying uh, together that all of us will develop this habit that won't just last 40 days, but it would truly last a lifetime. Anybody get the vision for what we're trying to do here uh, in this campaign? Uh, I was thinking the other day about a conversation that I had several years ago with, with uh, it was a person uh, who was, they were, they were relay, relaying to me some information about somebody they were following up on, somebody who had attended our church but had kind of uh, uh, fallen away. And they said to me that this person said, you know, pa the problem with grace is Pastor Wayne thinks that if you'll just read the Bible every day and pray, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say that nothing ever is challenging is not going to happen in your life, but how many of those are pretty big deals, right? The reality is we spend so much time focusing on peripheral things, sometimes we forget the main things, and that, and that is this area of Bible study and walking with the Lord every day. That's really the goal of what we're trying to do. And, and, and so I just want to encourage you, let's keep on keeping on, all right, and just keep on building those habits. Tonight is our small groups. We've had the largest ever small groups attendance ever uh, in these last uh, two Sunday nights, so thank you for that. Give it up for all the small group leaders who are making it happen these past few weeks. Remember that uh, there's some sort of football game happening later, so uh, we're adjusting the, the beginning time to 4 o'clock. Everybody say 4 o'clock. Unless your small group leader says otherwise, because believe it or not, some folks just don't care, all right? Uh, and they're more spiritual than the rest of us. And so unless your group says otherwise, they're going to start at 4 Okay, show me four, right there. Four o'clock is your small group, and uh, I know a lot of folks are going to stay after and, and have a celebration together. That's great. And uh, we've sold over 700 of the Bible study workbooks. How amazing is that? 700. We keep selling out. Pastor Tim said, Pastor Wayne, how many should we order this week? I said, I keep guessing wrong. You pick. You decide. <laughs> Let's get a bunch more. And that means that people are doing the daily Bible studies, and that's awesome. Our daily, our, our daily devotions, uh, some of you are doing that on the church app. Uh, David Jones, our media director who made that video, uh, he said this last week that our Grace app had something in the neighborhood of 20,000 impressions. I'm pretty impressed with the number of impressions on the impressive, never mind. Grace app. If you appreciate the Grace app, would you tell David Jones thank you right now and, and say great job. Awesome. Two weeks ago, our message was about inspiration. Last week, our message was about foundation. And today, our message is about illumination. If you take the notes that are in your bulletin with you right now, uh, we would appreciate that. The goal, remember, is that we are trying to build into our lives the daily habit of Bible study. We need a place, we need a time every day where we come to meet with God through His Word. Now, the reality is most people aren't doing that. Most people are not having a regular time with God through His Word. I read a survey this past week from Lifeway Research that said 84% of Americans own more than one Bible. 
84% of all Americans own more than one Bible. As a matter of fact, the average is 3.6 copies of God's Word, Americans own, but less than one third of them read it regularly. So we've got all kinds of Bibles, we're just not reading it. And the answer, the question is, so why don't we do that? Well, I think if we were to do a survey, most people would say, well, I, I just don't make it a priority. I'm too busy uh, uh, to do this. Others say, you know what, Pastor, if we're going to be honest, I don't really understand it. I don't understand what I'm reading because sometimes when I read God's Word, when I read the Bible, it's, it's like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Well, I'm reading it. I know it's good for me. It's, it's like taking bad medicine. It's difficult to get down, so to speak. Um, matter of fact, the same uh, s- survey that I read, it said according, uh, it says more than half of all Americans, 56%, say the Bible is difficult to understand. And one quote out of the article said, the people of God are asking for help in reading the Bible. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this campaign. We're, we're, we're trying to teach and equip the people of God that the Bible, so that we can study the Bible correctly. And the Bible can be a difficult book until we understand this principle of illumination. Everybody say illumination. This is a very important message here today, so I want you to give your best attention, take some notes, because this is going to be one you're going to want to, you're going to, want to watch and listen to over and over again. This is really, really important because, how many know, the more light you have the better you can see. The more light you have, the better you can see. The brighter the bulb, the clearer the image. That's one of the reasons I'm kind of upset about these newfangled lights and these wimpy little light bulbs. So I'm like, come on, give me some wattage, man. If you were to go uh, get your picture taken, you're going to go hire a photographer. You know, when you want a picture taken of you, you don't want that photographer bringing in the biggest, brightest lights. I mean, if it's shining on your face and you can't see, you don't want him to take your picture. You don't know why? Because those lights will expose everything. All the warts, all of the spots, all of the blemishes, uh, you know, things like that you don't want to see because, uh, because the more light, the more you can see. And so when you want a great picture, you want less light. How I many you know everybody's good looking in the dark? <laughs> well, almost everybody. Brightness equals clarity, right? The more light means the more you can see. Write this down. Here's the definition of illumination. Illumination is letting the Holy Spirit show me the meaning of God's Word and how it applies to my life. Illumination means letting the Holy Spirit show me the meaning of God's Word and how it applies to my life. Now here's where it gets good. Because the Holy Spirit is, plays a vital role in Bible study. If we approach the Bible as some piece of literature or some bad medicine that we're supposed to try to just choke down, we're missing it. we got to understand that we have a relationship with God through His Word because of the Holy Spirit. The Word and the Spirit go together. The Spirit and the Word go together. Nod your head if you're with me. It's not one or the other. It's both and because the Spirit gives the Word of God life. How many are with me so far? And so before Jesus went back to heaven, he explains the Holy Spirit's role uh, in our lives. Look at this, John 14, verse 26. The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to teach us. John 14, 17. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. John 16, verse 15. The Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Ephesians 1.17, I ask the glorious Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you His Spirit. The Spirit will make you wise, and watch this, the Spirit will let you understand what it means to know God. Now, here's, here's, here's where it's great. The Bible says the role of the Holy Spirit is to help us understand. The Holy Spirit gives illumination. The Holy Spirit helps me to understand what the Bible is saying. Now here's what's awesome about the Bible. The Bible is the only book where you can talk to the author while you're reading it. Think about that for a second. This past week I was reading a book about some Navy SEALs and some of their missions and I'm thinking, boy, it'd be cool to meet that guy and talk to him and get more information. But I'm not going to call up that guy. You know, I don't have his number. If I'm reading a Max Lucado book, man, that's great. Let me call up Max. Max, 
Come on, tell me, what was your inspiration? Max is not going to take my call. I don't have the boy's number. But when I'm reading the Bible, I can say, Holy Spirit, you authored this book. Would you show me more about what this means? Would you reveal it to my heart? Would you show how it applies to my life? How awesome is that? We can talk to the author while we're reading his book. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Pastor, we have eyes in our heart? Yeah, you sang about it earlier. Are you just repeating words? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. It's better if I go higher. I don't know why. <laughs> I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now, that word enlightened is the word photizo, okay? And it's where we get the word photo. Now, what is, what is a photo? A photo is an image of light on a piece of paper or an image of light in a digitized form, right? So to enlighten means to shine a light on something or somebody. Now, you've seen the cartoons or whatever. When, when somebody gets a bright idea, the light bulb appears above their head. Eureka! I got it! I got an idea. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit is involved in our reading of the Bible, we'll be reading along and it's like, bam, there it is. Just like some, some folks alluded to it on the video. It's amazing what God shows me about scriptures I've read my entire life. That's the role of the Holy Spirit to help us to do that. That's illumination. Your spiritual eyes were opened. Your, the eyes of your heart were awakened. And the reality is, for some of you, that's never happened before. You've never had that experience of illumination. And so you read, uh, uh, today we're going to talk about what happens when God opens my eyes. And then we're going to take a few minutes at the end and we're going to talk about how to make sure that that happens, okay? So here are four, uh, four things that happen when God opens your eyes. Because how many know we live in two realms at the same time, the spiritual realm and the physical realm? right? We live in the physical realm where we can see everything with our eyes, but the spiritual realm is very real as well. Matter of fact, the spiritual realm began before the physical realm was created. The spiritual realm will last longer than the physical realm. Are, are you with me? And so we need to open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see with spiritual eyes. So what happens when that happens? First of all, I see the solution to my problem. When illumination takes place, when God opens my eyes, I see the solution to my problems. There's a story uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 21, the story of Abraham and Sarah. Remember that God promised to Abraham and Sarah, uh, Isaac, the, the, let me back up, Isaac wasn't on the scene yet. God promises to Abraham this, this descendant that was, going to, uh, that was going to be his promised one. And so Abraham and Sarah get to be beyond childbearing age. They're both well past childbearing age. And so uh, Sarah comes up with this idea, says, Abraham, uh, you know, obviously God's not going to give us this, this child, this, this heir. And so she comes up with this idea and says, why don't you take Hagar and have a child by her? And then you'll have the heir that God promised. Now, how many know this was Sarah's plan? This was not God's plan. Okay. Uh, when we try to justify our actions, based on what we think God's plan should be, we're going to experience some trouble. All right? So Abraham has a child by Hagar. The boy's name is Ishmael. Uh, Ishmael begins to grow. And then by a great miracle, God gives Isaac to Abraham and Sarah. Okay, and now there's something that begins to happen in this dysfunctional family, right? Sarah gets jealous of Hagar and Ishmael because Ishmael's the oldest child. She's, she's probably uh, speculating, you know, uh, Ishmael's the firstborn. Who's probably going to be the heir? And so Sarah gets jealous and kicks Hagar and Ishmael out of the house to fend for themselves. Not very nice. In Genesis 21, verse 14, the Bible says, Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He sent them on her shoulders and they sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba, and when the water was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. She went off and sat down nearby, for she thought, I can't watch my boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to cry. She began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? 
Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies here. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Now we pick it up in Genesis 21, verse 19. It's there on your outline. It's on the screen. Say it with me. Then God opened her eyes. Say it again. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, so she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. The solution to her problem was right in front of her. But she was so frustrated. She was so hurt. She felt so alone, so isolated. She couldn't even see it. But the Bible says that God opened her eyes to see the solution to her problem. Now, I don't know what you're going through here today in church. And you may think there's no solution. You may think that God doesn't care. There's one dead end after another. You need to have your mind illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God so you can see the solution to to whatever situation you're facing today. Because you're probably not going to see the solution by yourself. Other folks are probably not going to be able to offer you a solution. But if you will get into God's Word, this is why we're doing 40 days in the Word. So that the Holy Spirit can illuminate your mind and your heart so you can see the solutions to your problem. Because how many know when you see things from God's point of view, you begin to realize that there is a vast array of resources that are available to you. Come on, somebody. Give God some praise in this place. Isn't that awesome? God's good. The second benefit of what happens when God opens my eyes is that I see the barrier to my progress. I see the barrier to my progress. Now, how many of you, and don't raise your hand, you've ever wanted to do something and, and you just kept having something block you or some sort of obstacle. Maybe you were trying to get out of debt or maybe you started start a business, start a family, a goal, a dream, a ministry, and you've been trying to make progress, but you just keep bumping up against something. You, something keeps stopping you and, and you don't know what's going on. The reality is we need to have our eyes open so that we can see what's going on and what's keeping us. And there's another story in Numbers chapter 22, a prophet of God named Balaam agrees to help the enemies of Israel. And in the Old Testament, the Bible says God was pretty ticked off by this. God was pretty upset at Balaam because he was going to help out the enemies of Israel uh, in what they were going to do. So God, uh, uh, Balaam's riding his donkey down the road. I'm giving the, the really short version. And God sends an angel to stand in front of the donkey. Okay. Now the donkey can see the angel, but Balaam can't. So let's read a little bit of this in verse 22. Uh, God was furious that Balaam was going, so he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. Balaam's donkey suddenly saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. So the donkey bolted off the road into a field, but Balaam beat it and turned it back on the road. He's like, donkey, what you doing? You know, the donkey just takes off. It's like, bam, 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 get back on the road. The donkey gets back on the road. And the Bible says, uh, the angel of the Lord stood at a place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing there, and it tried to squeeze by, crushing Balaam's foot. There's the angel, you know, with the flaming sword. I got Balaam on my back beating the snot out of me. So I'm just going to try to squeeze around. And what happens is he crushes Balaam's leg against this, this, this rock. Do you know what Balaam did? He beat the donkey again. He's like, bam, 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 because Balaam didn't see the the obstacle in front of him. One more time, the angel of the Lord moved farther down the road. How many know God's not going to give up on this? All right. And, and, And stood in a place so narrow that the donkey couldn't get by at all. And the Bible says, this time when the donkey saw the angel, it just laid down under Balaam. (laughs) You know what Balaam did again? Bam, bam, bam. He starts beating the donkey again. We're going to pick it up in chapter 22, verse 31. Read it with me. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. It's powerful, isn't it? God opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. Now listen, when your plans aren't working out, when things aren't going the way you think that you, you think they should be going, it's tempting to get angry at everybody else. It's tempting to take your frustration out on your family. You know, you're yelling at your wife, you're angry with your kids, you're beating your donkey, because you don't understand what's going on. What is blocking my progress? What is hindering the way? We need to let God show us what's holding us back. 
Perhaps he's trying to keep you from making a serious mistake. Perhaps that block in the road is, is God's way of saying, don't go any farther. Danger is down the road. Come on, somebody. But we're not going to see that ourselves. We need God to open our eyes. If you find yourself in a rut here today, a spiritual rut, an emotional rut, a relationship rut, you know what reading God's Word will do every day? It'll root you out of that rut and get you going in the right direction. Come on, put your hands together and give God some praise one more time. Awesome. Number three, the third reason that we need illumination is because when I, my, my mind, my heart is illuminated, I see the defense for what's attacking me. I see the defense for what's attacking me. How many know that spiritual warfare is very real? The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against people, against governments, against... The Bible says we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Right now in this room, there is a spiritual war going on for you. For your attention, for your heart, for your family, for your relationships. I can guarantee you if we could see with spiritual eyes here today, we would see angels in this room. And the enemy is also working in this room. There's a fight going on. There's a war going on. And that's why we need illumination. Another story, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 10. The Arameans are at war with Israel. This is the Old Testament. But every time they'd attack Israel, God would warn Elisha to what the battle plan was going to be. And so this begins to frustrate, frustrate the king of Aram pretty quickly because every, every time they would come up with this plan to attack Israel, uh, God would tell Elisha, and Israel's army was always in the right place at the right time, and they kept losing. He was frustrated. And so the king says, there's a traitor. Somebody's telling secrets. There's some sort of mole in the, in the camp here. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 10. This happened several times. So the king of Aram became very upset. He called his officers and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing uh, the king of Israel my plans? It's not us, my lord, one of the officers replied. Elisha, the prophet of Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. How many know that's real illumination? That's a whole different level of illumination, right? So the king said, you go find where Elisha is, and we'll send troops to seize him. The report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sends a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When Elisha's servant got up early the next morning and went outside, he saw, with his physical eyes, troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. The servant whose name was, uh, he says, what will we do now? He cries to Elijah. Elisha says, don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than are on theirs. Now, how many at this point, the servant says, I don't see that. All I see is we're surrounded. We are in trouble. Okay. We are about to be taken out. And look at this. We'll pick it up in verse 17 of 2 Kings chapter 6. Then Elisha prayed, say it with me, O oh Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes. Elisha prayed, God, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Oh, that's good. Elisha prays, open his eyes, God. And all of a sudden, the servant's eyes were open. He didn't just see the armies of Aram in the physical realm. He looked up and he saw the chariots of fire, the angels of heaven with flaming swords in their hand. And he heard Elisha say, there's more of them up there than there is more of them down there. Come on, somebody. The enemy loves us to think that he is more powerful than he is. The enemy loves for the men and women of God to feel like you're all by yourself. Nobody else is serving Jesus. It's not going to work out. You're, you are isolated. And God's prayer for us, would you open your eyes and begin to realize that all around you are angels who are set guard over you so that you won't set, dash your foot against the stone. Somebody gave this definition of fear years ago. False evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. That's how the enemy works. The Bible says the enemy walks about like a roaring lion. 
And the reason that he walks about like a roaring lion, because he can't compare to the lion of the tribe of Judah who breaks every chain. Come on, somebody. Isn't that awesome? God is with us. When I read the Bible, the Holy Spirit illuminates to me, and I begin to see from God's viewpoint, my, the eyes of my heart begin to be open, and I realize it's going to be all right. Because there's more that are for us than those that are against us. Now, when I watch the news, I don't see that. When I read the newspaper, I see, I see spiritual warfare going on, and it seems like we might not win. And then I read the Bible, and I read the book of Revelation, and I see one who's going to come back on a white horse, and on his thigh, and on his vesture says, King of kings and Lord of lords. Come on, isn't that good? God's word gives us illumination so we can see the defense for what's attacking me. Why should I be part of 40 days in the word? Why do I need to open the Bible on a regular basis? Because fear will leave your life. Fear will begin to disappear. You're afraid of everything. You're anxious about everything. God's word gives you faith. And the illumination of the Holy Spirit begins to realize, if, God, if I'm on God's side, me and God are a majority. Fourth reason that we need illumination, number four, is I see that God is walking with me. I need to have the eyes of my heart open. I need illumination because I need to see that God is walking with me. How many times have you been in a season of your life, I've been there, where you wondered, God, where are you? Why did you leave me alone? We're going through stuff all by ourselves. There's another story in Luke chapter 24. The day Jesus was resurrected, there's two disciples walking down the road to Emmaus, and they're very discouraged. They're talking about all the events that just had happened. Jesus, whom they believed to be the Messiah, they thought he was God. He was arrested. He was beaten. He was crucified like a criminal. And he's dead. And the Bible says Jesus comes alongside and starts talking to these guys. He says, hey, man, what's going on? And they say, are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't have a clue about what just happened around here? And Jesus said, why don't you tell me? Isn't that funny? Jesus is kind of playing dumb. Tell me what's going on. And so they recount the whole story about, about how this Jesus of Nazareth had come, and, and we thought he was God, and we thought he was the Messiah, and, and then they killed me to death. Now, there were some women that, that, that went to the tomb this morning, and, and, and they said he was resurrected, and kind of implying that they're not sure. And the Bible says that, that Jesus, they didn't, they didn't realize who he was. He says he begins to explain to them from the Scriptures. He said, didn't the Scriptures say that he had to suffer this way? The Messiah when he came. And they still didn't get it. They still didn't understand. So he sits down and eats bread with them. Chapter 24, verse 31 of Luke says, Then, say it with me, their eyes were opened. Wow. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. In their grief, because they were grieving, Jesus had been right there beside them. How many know sometimes when, when there's enormous loss in our lives, it can blind us? And, and we're like, God, where are you? God, why don't you care? God, how did you let this happen? And sometimes we forget he's right there, but we don't see it because we're blinded by our pain. We're, we're blinded by our grief. And, and there are people in this room who know exactly what I'm talking about, even recently. People who have lost loved ones. I don't know what you've lost this last year. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've lost your health or a job or, or maybe a ministry. And you're grieving today. And you can't see that every step of the way, Jesus has been walking with you. But when the Holy Spirit illumines His Word to us, we are reminded that He was with us the entire time. Do you remember the old poem, Footprints in the Sand? It was at those times, Jesus said, I carried you. How important is this issue of illumination? It's a pretty big deal, isn't it? I'm not just reading words on a page. I need the Holy Spirit to open my eyes so that 
I can see the solutions to my problems. So that I see the barrier to my progress. So that I see the defense for what's attacking me. And so that I can see that he is with me all the time. Pastor Steve, come and help me. We're going to talk about how do, how, do I, how do we do that? Just real quickly, how do, we, how do we get illumination? How do we get to that place where, where God will open our eyes? Real quickly, number one, I need to begin a relationship with Jesus. If I'm going to have illumination, I need to begin a relationship with Jesus. Because until I trust him for salvation, the Bible says, I'm spiritually blind. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 2 Corinthians 4 says, The devil who rules this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They cannot see the light of the good news. John 3, verse 3, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see, are you seeing this? No one can see the kingdom of God until he's born again. You're not, this stuff's not going to make much sense to you until you get right with God. It, people of God, we need to remember, we can't expect sinners and unrepentant people to understand why we do what we do, why our priorities are the way they are. Some of you try to explain stuff to your unsaved friends and family and they just don't get it. You know why? Because they can't see it. Their eyes are blinded by the enemy. And so in order for you to have illumination, you need to have that veil taken away by giving your life to Jesus Christ. Something happens because the Bible says you go from death to life. You go from a place of being blind to the light of the Spirit begins to shine in your heart and you can see the way that you should go. Somebody say amen. In just a second, if you've not given your life to Jesus, we're going to give you an opportunity to pray. And give your life to Christ. How do I have illumination? Number two, I need to ask God in faith to open my eyes. Psalm chapter 119 verse 18 is a prayer, a scripture verse that we should probably pray every time we go to read the Bible. I want you to say it out loud with me. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. So here I am, I've got my place, I've got my chair, I've got my table, I've got wherever I'm going, and i got my Bible, and I pray this verse. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. You're talking to the author. It's a prayer. God, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. A very simple verse, a very easy verse that all of us can memorize right now. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. The Bible says, ask. And you'll receive. Pastor, I don't understand the Bible. Talk to the author before you start reading it and pray that simple prayer. And that, it doesn't matter how many degrees that you don't have from a Bible college or how intellectual you weren't in grade school or high school. Forget about all of that because God loves to show you himself in his word. Number three, how do I have my eyes enlightened? I need to come with a humble attitude. A humble attitude. Pride has this way of just blinding us to everything. Psalm 25 verse 9 says, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them His way. That means I come to God's Word with a teachable attitude. I come to God's Word not thinking about my brother, my sister, my friends, my family. I come to the Bible thinking about what do you have to say to me today? Number four, I come with a I cleanse my heart of sin and conflict. In order for us to have the eyes of our heart opened, we have to cleanse our heart of sin and conflict. Look at Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see. Don't miss this. Look at this. Look at this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When we have sin in our heart, bitterness, disobedience. Something begins to happen to us. James says we deceive ourselves. And, and things begin to be hazy and, and murky and, and we can't quite picture things the way they should be. So the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God in the scripture. They'll see the barrier to their progress. They'll see the solution to their problem. Come on, somebody. They'll see the defense for what's attacking them. Are you getting this? Well, I'm, I'm preaching myself excited. I hope you're doing it. So when I come to God's Word, 
I pray this prayer. God, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And I pray 1 John 1, 9. The scripture says if we confess our sins. It's one of the memory verses that people are trying to get right over there so they can go to one big party. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, how often do you pray that prayer? Well, pretty much every day. Every time you open the book. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Look at this last one, number five. Commit in advance to do what God says. Commit in advance to do what God says. We're talking about in this, the issue of the authority of God's word means I don't just read it because it's good medicine. I don't just read it because I should. I come to the word of God understanding that it is the final authority in my life. Every decision I make, every business decision, every relationship decision, every family decision, every financial decision, the word of God is the final authority on all things. We live in a culture let me be clear. We live in a culture, the American church culture, where we go to church and we do our thing and we go to work and we follow another set of rules. Or we go home and we follow another set of rules. No, 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 no. If the Bible is the final authority in your life, it's the final authority in everything. So we come to God's word committing, Lord, I'll do whatever you say. And here's what's going to happen. The light of the spirit will shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And you're going to come to church and you're going to go to small group and you're going to talk to your friends. Guess what God showed me? Have you ever seen that before? And you get excited about God's word. You get excited about what you're seeing because you're seeing with spiritual eyes. Why do I need to be part of 40 Days in the Word? Why should you not give up on trying to make this daily habit a daily habit? Why should you not shrink back? Why should, bring, should you be part of this? Because God wants to give you illumination so that you can see and so that you can overcome. I want to invite our elders, our pastors, our small group leaders to come and stand across the front here this morning. And we're going to respond to God's word today with an opportunity to pray and respond to God's word ministering to our hearts. Because here's what's happened in this room today. The Holy Spirit has been enlightening you. The Holy Spirit has been shining a light on your problem. The Holy Spirit has revealed to you the barrier to your progress. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to you about a solution to your problem. The Holy Spirit has been reminding some of you that even though you're hurting, He's been with you the entire time. So if you're here today and you say, first of all, I need to give my life to Christ because you're blind until you give your life to Christ. You can't see. You don't get it. You don't understand. But when you come to the cross, a supernatural transaction takes place. And the Bible says... He'll give you a new heart. So in just a moment, when we come to pray, if you need to give your life to Christ, you're going to find one of these leaders and just say, I need to get right with God today. And they'll, they'll pray with you, and you'll get right with God. You're here today, and you say, you know what, Pastor, as, as, as we were praying today, the Holy Spirit was just convicting me. There's barriers in front of me, and I've been frustrated. And, and I've been beating the donkey, yelling at my kids. I've been getting all upset with everybody else, and I realize they're not the problem. They're not my enemy. I need God to help me to see the solution to my problem or the barrier in front of me. And some of you are saying, you know, you're like Hagar. You identify, God, I'm out here all by myself, and I don't see how I'm going to get out. Maybe financially you're in the desert. Maybe relationally you're just all by yourself. And, and you see your boy, and you see him dying, and you're crying. And God wants to open your eyes so that you can see a well. And I believe if you come pray today, he'll do that in your heart and in your life. Some of you are under attack here today under attack. Your health is under attack. Your, your life is under attack. I've had several people tell me over the last few weeks, boy, pastor, just as soon as we started 40 days in the word, boy, did it come. Guess what? There are more for you today. There are those who are against you. And we're going to agree together in prayer that God will give you victory in your life. So if you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer for, for a situation, whatever, let's pray together today. Amen. Pastor Steve's going to sing this song. Why don't we all stand if you would? And if you need prayer today for any of those reasons, I want you to come now and find one of these leaders and let's pray together. God bless you as you come. Thank you, God.